Okay, everybody, welcome to this UCL lunchtime lecture. Delighted to see so many people here today, especially that it's such nice, well, quite nice weather outside, so, you know, true dedication. Fantastic to see you. Um, it's my great privilege today to invite our speaker um, to talk about um, artificial intelligence and education. Um, my name is um, Le Dr. Leslie Gourley, and I'm the head of Department of Culture, Communication and Media, which is one of the departments in the Institute of Education. And among other subjects, we are um, the home department of the Knowledge Lab, which is a specialist unit which looks at technology and education. And that's the, the home um, research unit of our guest speaker today, um, Professor Rose Luckin. Um, I've been asked before I get too far into it to make sure you've all noticed this rather bright leaflet in front of you. This event is a kind of pre-event um, for the very exciting It's All Academic Festival, which is being held on the 10th of June. And there's lots and lots of really interesting events for all the family. And I've been asked to encourage you to, to attend that, to let your friends and family know, um, because I think it's going to be a really, really um, great event for everyone, not only university students, but anyone else who would like to, to come along. Um, there's going to be talks, tours, workshops, demonstrations, and even, I'm told, an improvised opera in the Grant Museum. So it sounds really exciting, and I hope as many of you as possible can make it. Um, and I, I also want to remind you that it's for all ages as well. It's not um, for youngsters as well as adults. So anyway, back to today. And as I said, um, we're very, very lucky to have Professor Rose Luckin here. She's going to talk about a really fascinating subject, obviously a, a popular subject by looking at the numbers um, in the room today, artificial intelligence. It's a hot topic, um, as you know, and it becomes more and more relevant with every passing year when we think about the possible impact on jobs, on our lifestyles, our security, and even on our understanding of what it means to be human, you could argue as well. So it's a very profound um, set of technological changes that are sweeping through society worldwide. And this is the sort of topic that Rose is exploring at the Knowledge Lab as part of um, culture, communication and media. Um, one of the important points about the Knowledge Lab is the mission to develop digital technologies to transform education. So not only because it's an interesting topic, but how can we use t technologies to create better um, inclusion, better experiences for education for students and pupils in all the phases and indeed outside of formal education as well. And Rose is going to be telling us a bit about her work around that. And of course, the potential is massive. You, as many of you students, will already be very engaged in educational technologies, I would imagine. And it's an area which is in constant state of change and very, very um, exciting for that reason. And Rose is uniquely placed to lead this debate. She's really is one of the, the pioneering thinkers in um, digital learning. And, and we're you know, very, very lucky to, to have her in our department. Now, it's billed as a lecture, but there will be um, a chance for questions, um, about 20 minutes of questions towards the end, I believe. So, you know, don't be shy when the time comes. Do put your hand up and ask a question or, or make a comment. So, without further ado, I'm absolutely delighted to hand over to Professor Rose Luckin. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Before I start, I just want to check that you can all hear me. Is that... Nobody's saying no, so I will take it that you can. So, that's great. Thank you, Leslie, and thank you for inviting me to give this lunchtime lecture, and thank you to all of you for coming along, giving up your lunch uh, lunchtime. Though nobody's eating lunch, which I was kind of expecting everybody to be you know, bringing their pack up with them. And I was going to say, oh, I'll give you food for thought to go with your, your, your food and your pack up, but you're not. So I'll still just try and give you some food for thought. Um, the title, yes, is AI in the classroom, but actually maybe it should be intelligence in the classroom because I'm going to take a broader look at intelligence in order to contextualize what artificial intelligence is and therefore what it might or might not be able to do to help us in the classroom. And this is very much respecting the interdisciplinary nature of artificial intelligence. And I will pick that up um, in a little while. But first, I wanted to say something that hopefully will 
um, position what I'm going to talk about in a very particular sort of way. So I think there are two main threads that are distinct but interconnected when it comes to thinking about artificial intelligence and education. The first is the fact that we need to help more people understand what artificial intelligence is and we need to teach people about artificial intelligence, how to build artificial intelligence systems, how to design them, how to understand the implications of these systems so that we can make informed decisions about what we do and don't accept. I'm not going to talk about that today. The second, but interconnected, um, element is the way in which we can use artificially intelligent technologies to help teaching and learning. And that's the bit I'm going to focus on today. It's not that the other bit isn't important, it is, but it's not what I'm focusing on today. So without further ado, I will move on to the subject of artificial intelligence. Now, I don't know, because I don't know anything about you, other than the people I happen to know in the audience. But I imagine that when I say the words artificial intelligence, you probably think of something like one of these. So you might think about a film like She or Ex Machina, or even AI. You might think about robots. You might think about Siri or Alexa. You might think about deep learning. But I suspect in most cases, you probably think about a technology. And what I want to put to you today is that we need to think beyond the actual technologies of artificial intelligence if we're going to tackle what's really useful about AI when it comes to learning and teaching, both inside and outside the classroom. So what I want to tell you is that Artificial intelligence is an interdisciplinary subject. It includes psychology, philosophy, linguistics, as well as computer science, and artificial intelligence programming, architectures, and methods and techniques. And unfortunately, at the moment, as Leslie pointed out, it's a very hot topic, but people tend to move straight to the technology. They tend to think, oh, it's a robot, or, oh, it's deep learning, oh, it it can play chess, it, it can beat world champions at Go. And that's great, but it forgets the first bit, which is where intelligence, in terms of human intelligence, is so incredibly important. Because what we should be focusing on is how artificial intelligence can help us deal with some of the really challenging problems that we face. And from my perspective, those are the challenging problems that we fa face when it comes to teaching and learning. And by that, I mean the sorts of problems around teacher shortages, expertise shortages, increasing diversity in terms of the needs of students and learners within education and the need of the changing workplace. There's lots of conversation about how automation is altering the way the world of work will be, and yet we're not sure exactly what skills and expertise we will need our young people to have. So we need to be constantly mindful about how we can help them learn throughout their lives. And actually, maybe artificial intelligence, which could be seen as one of the causes of the changes in the workplace, can actually be one of the things that helps us to keep people trained throughout their working lives. So that's my first point. Let's remember, artificial intelligence is not just about the technologies or the techniques. It's about a lot more. It's about unpacking the problem and designing a solution. And then saying, OK, what technologies, what techniques, what methods can we use, both human and artificially intelligent? So a little question for you. Where have you been this morning? You've probably been out and about, maybe on the UCL campus, I've been over in the Knowledge Lab, been on a bus, I've done various different things, I can reflect back on all of the things I've done. What do you know about UCL? For some of you, you'll be a visitor and therefore you may not know that much. Others of you may have been here for 10, 20, 30 years and you know loads about UCL, but you've probably got a pretty good idea what you know. You know what you know about UCL. 
How well do you understand calculus? In my case, not that great. Did it once, don't use it all the time. Probably could get back up to speed, but I'd have to do a bit of work. How are you feeling? Good. I'm feeling slightly nervous, but I'm enjoying myself as well, so that's all good. We know what we know. We know how we feel to an extent. It's not perfect, and I'm not saying it's perfect, but we can appreciate and we can learn more about ourselves. Does an AI know what it knows? Now, I've posed you that question, and what I'm going to do in order to tackle that question is I'm going to go back to a very old thought experiment. And if there are people in the audience who know lots about artificial intelligence, they may think, why is she doing that? That's really old. I will explain. There is method in my madness. So if you think about Google Translate, now Google Translate is actually pretty good these days. It's not perfect but I certainly use it quite a lot to help me understand if I'm trying to look at a particular email that I've received and it's in a different language, or if I'm translating a web page. It, you know, it can give me a pretty good gist, so it, it's not bad. Is it intelligent? What do people think? Let's ask. Those of you who think it is intelligent, can you put your hands up? Okay, a few. Those of you who think it isn't intelligent, Okay, right. So there's a mix of opinions, and, and that's good. We're thinking about it. Some people might think it's intelligent, some might not. The thought experiment I'm going to talk to you about is called the Chinese Room, and it was introduced by a philosopher called John Searle. And John Searle was trying to make the point that, and this is going back a couple of decades, that artificially intelligent machines at that time, which were rule-based, so quite old-fashioned, did not understand, were not intelligent. So he posed the question. He said, OK, I am shut inside a room, and I am passed in, on one side of the room, characters in Chinese script. I have a big rule book and lots of pieces of paper, and I use that rule book, and I translate them into English symbols that I pass out the other side of the room. I've lost my little red dot, but I'm sure you can work it out. And I do this, and do, I complete my translation. So to the outside world, I'm translating Chinese into English. But I don't understand a word of Chinese. His argument being, therefore, the system is not intelligent. Now, we've moved on a lot from the rule-based systems that were the subject of this kind of a rule book. We have now these neural networks. It's neural network technology that's improved the way that Google Translate works in the last year or so. We have deep learning networks, which are the sort of things that Google DeepMind use, and they're much faster and they're much more efficient. But actually, they still don't know what they know. So to a certain extent, I think we can still be doubtful about how intelligent they are. Of course, a lot of this turns on how we define intelligence, and whilst I would love to go into that today, I haven't quite got time to do that as well. The point I'm making is that as humans, we understand what we know. We can explain it. We may not understand it perfectly. We may not be able to explain it perfectly, but we can go some way down the road. At the moment, AI systems, it's not a skill that they have. So if we take the classic situation for any parent, I mean, any sorry, any parents. Actually, it is a situation for parents as well. But anybody who's teaching in schools, for example, and actually teaching in a university is a slightly different situation, but you do have to explain to your students how well they're doing. But I know from having taught in schools that a parent evening is, is, is quite an you know, tense moment when you've got to explain to a, you know, some parents that actually their child's not achieving very well and you need to explain how you know that, why they're not achieving very well. As educators, we need those skills of self-reflection. Self we need to be able to understand what we know and we need to be able to understand what our students know. We need to be able to justify any decisions we make about the sort of learning that those students do and the sort of teaching that we provide. So 
for me, in the foreseeable future, I cannot see artificial intelligence replacing tutors. So what might artificial intelligence be good for? Well, artificial intelligence, I believe, is good for helping us to understand what's happening for our students, for our learners, and then helping those same learners and students to understand more about themselves. So it's about helping teachers to understand their students, it's about parents to understand their, their children, and it's about students themselves to understand more about how well they're doing. So in this little picture, we have two different students taking a very different approach to building the same aeroplane kit. And as a teacher, I would want to know something about those individual differences between those learners. And I would want to be able to support each of those learners in a different way. And that's where, for me, artificial intelligence comes in. It's all about unpacking the black box of learning. And that's the research that I've been working on for a number of years now. So to make that a little clearer, I'm going to tell you a story because I always believe that stories are, are, are a good way to communicate. So I'm going to tell you about a teacher called Jude. And bear with me as I go through this. This is not just some sci-fi. This is the kind of research that we're doing at the moment to try and build systems that would enable us to do this. And this, the full article, is a blog post on something called How We Learn, which is part of How We Get to Next on Medium. So it's a November morning in a school classroom, and the year is 2027. As the winter sun streams through the windows, a fourth grade teacher named Jude adjusts the blinds and is suddenly struck by how little the room has changed in the seven years since her first day. It's still arranged around several large circular tables and student pictures decorate the walls. In many senses, it's the same old messy learning environment it always was. But then again, there are those small but visible camera lenses mounted in the ceiling, the microphones embedded in the tables and the virtual whiteboards that take their form out of nowhere. And at Jude's side, there is her AI teaching assistant, Colin, whom she's named after her childhood friend. In fact, so many aspects of how Jude understands her students' learning are different now, thanks to her machine aide, Colin. Through working with Colin, she has become somewhat of a metaphorical judo master harnessing the data and analytical power of artificial intelligence to tailor a new kind of education to each of her students. Her role at the helm of the classroom, however, is fundamentally unchanged. Since Colin makes ongoing assessments based on daily student performance and engagement in the classroom, there is simply no longer any need for what were often inaccurate and stressful evaluations through examinations and tests. The AI aid's primary task is to build and maintain learner models for each child based on a combination of data gathered over time with things like voice recognition, which identifies who is doing and saying what in a team activity, and eye tracking to note engagement and focus. The profiles are updated continuously and monitoring students' progress against an analysis of their emotional and motivational state. Not only do students and their parents have their own interfaces for viewing how a student is progressing in various curricula and skills, but artificial intelligence in education now means there is evidence on record at a class, school, district, and country level about academic performance, and way more. The need for national and international testing is indeed a venture of the past. And if you want to know more about that story, as I say, you can access it on the Medium website. <coughs> so that might seem like a fantasy, but actually a lot of that is a reality in terms of the technology to achieve it exists, the understanding to achieve it exists. Because one of the important things to remember about artificial intelligence is that it's a learning science. It's about combining what we understand about how people learn and what effective teaching is with an understanding of technologies that use artificial intelligence techniques. All too often, we forget that we need to 
understand about learning in order to build good artificial intelligence systems to support it. So here are two pieces of research. And actually, what's really nice is that my colleague, Mutlu, would you like to wave your hands? <laughs> was my collaborator on the piece of research called Pellas that I'm going to talk about first. So actually, I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to talk about this piece of research first, and then I'll come to Pellas second. But we can always engage Mutlu in some questions at the end if you want to ask more about Pellas. So I'll start with this. Now, this right-hand side of the screen is a piece of software called the Ecolab. It's very old, at least 10 years since it was used in a classroom. But I use it because it demonstrates how we can use artificial intelligence algorithms to track a learner's progress as they work with a piece of software. And not only can we track their progress throughout this little map of the part of the curriculum that they've been focusing on, which is what the nodes on that thing that looks like an underground map um, is trying to depict. But we can also look at how much help they've used and how much, of a diff how much difficulty they've chosen to use for their tasks. And in this way, we can scaffold or support their learning in a very fine-grained way. We can make suggestions to them about how they might try a harder task if they seem to be finding everything easier. And we can try and pull them back from using a maximum amount of help if we think they're not really engaging with the material and they're just gaming the system. Now, this piece of software was trialed in classrooms. And what we were evaluating across a number of different studies was how much, this was primary school children, understood about themselves, how much they were able to develop good metacognitive skills so that they were better at predicting what level of difficulty they could cope with and at selecting the right amounts of support. Because whilst it's possible to build very nice artificially intelligent systems to teach all manner of different subjects, it's actually very expensive. And therefore, what I think we might be better to do is to look at some of these higher order skills and think about we help, how we help learners to understand more about themselves and their own learning needs. And that was the aim of this system. And the delightful thing was over a number of trials, admittedly not large scale, there were significant differences between different groups of students who had used this system and had used a system that didn't have this metacognitive scaffolding. And what pleased me the most was the students who gained the most with those who allegedly were the least able academically, thus demonstrating that this is not just a skill set for the able, it's a skill set that can be developed across different abilities and knowledge levels. So that's my first example on the right. Now, that's a piece of software where the data the system is collecting and analyzing in order to produce this representation for teachers, learners, parents, and it's a very simplistic one, is all contained within a piece of software. But that's not how things are anymore. When students come to UCL, we can track them in so many different ways if we wanted to. We know where they are physically. We know when they've been to the library. We know when they've accessed resources online. Social media can be harvested. There are so many different data sources that we could tap into, in addition to interactions they may have with specific pieces of software um, with members of the teaching faculty. And one of the areas that my colleague Mukulu and I are particularly interested in is the area of collaborative problem solving, because we believe it's a skill and ability that will be of increasing importance in the workplace. Because in most jobs, we work as teams. Mutlu and I work as a team. We work with other colleagues as well. That, that's how it is. And problem solving, applying that knowledge, is increasingly important. And being able to synthesize across different disciplines is increasingly important. So the picture up here is that I'm not very good with my, <laughs> with my light, but I'm trying to show up here, is of a group of three students taking part in a collaborative problem solving task. You'll see that they're wearing markers on their hands, and this is to help us track the physical movement that those students 
are making as they're trying to solve this task. You can't see their faces, but we are also using eye tracking technologies to look at where they're focusing, whether they're focusing on the task or a person or somewhere completely different. Um, this you can't see very clearly. Um, we have two buttons, which we call sentiment buttons. That one is for when you're feeling positive and like you're getting somewhere, and the other is for when you're feeling a bit frustrated. So we're trying to capture information about their emotional well-being. And they interact with different pieces of technology that you can just see here to build. This is a toy that they're trying to build. And we collect technology from, we collect data from the technology that they're using. So this is a huge number of data sources that we're collecting. And this is not because I believe that we can have this kind of complex data system in a classroom necessarily. This is because we want to understand more about the collaborative problem-solving process and how we can identify <coughs> signifiers of good collaborative problem-solving and of situations where the learners need some support from the teacher. Because if you're a teacher in a classroom of 30 children and you have them working in groups of five, that's six groups. How are you going to split yourself? So being able to have a system that could flag up to you when you needed to put some information into the group and what kind of information you might need to provide or what kind of support could be very useful. So the object of this research project is to understand how we can identify signifiers of collaborative problem solving as they happen. And this is the framework that we use um, to do this. So across the top, we have um, features of collaboration that are important. And down the side, we have the features of problem solving that are important. And this has been taken from a, a wide uh, group of literatures on collaborative problem solving. And what we do is we observe as students do the collaborative problem solving and we mark when we think different activities are happening. We've tried doing it live, we tried doing it from the video. We do this so that we can then try and map the automatically captured data to our human coded data so that we can try and identify the signifiers in that automatically generated data and turn it into information that fits into these characters so that eventually we can provide teachers and learners with up-to-date dynamic information about how, how well they're doing <coughs> at establishing and maintaining shared understanding. How are they doing in terms of recognizing their knowledge and skill deficiencies? So the whole point is to try and take the messy situation that exists in real classrooms, lecture rooms, the workplace, and create learning analytics using artificial intelligence in order to tell teachers, learners, parents, lecturers more about what's going on for the people who are taking part in that collaborative problem solving process. So this is all about unpacking that black box of learning and the AI being an assistant for the lecturer. Now one of my particular passions is to try and find a way of moving on from exams and tests. We know exams are stressful. We know children sitting their standard attainment tasks in schools get anxious. We stop the teaching. We do the testing. It's not effective in so many different ways. But this little cartoon I like because I think it you know, points out just one of the deficiencies. We're not all the same. And so using this notion of unpacking learning as it happens, I wrote a piece that you may like to reference because it's free online in nature.com on using artificial intelligence-based assessment systems to replace exams and tests. And in doing this, I calculated as best as I could, given the poor information that's available, the current cost to the, to the English education system of exams annually. And, oh, any guesses what that might be? Anybody like to guess? How many millions? 
Nobody's going to guess. Okay. In 2005, there was an evaluation done by PwC, and the English examination system cost £613 million a year. So if you use the Bank of England's inflation rate, you get uh, not far shy of a billion pounds a year. And that's an increasing figure, because there are always more people needed to examine the increasing number of students. So we have to come up with an alternative. And in my view, AI offers that alternative, because not only does it do the assessment all the time in the background, so we can learn how people are progressing, we can learn how entire education systems are progressing indeed. But more importantly, from my point of view, we can open up that information to the learners themselves, to the teachers, so that we can start to help people become effective lifelong learners, because that is definitely something that will be needed in the workforce as we move forward. So I'm going to use one more example, because I want to stop in about seven minutes so that we can have some questions. And the second example is very different, quite deliberately. And it's about not using artificial intelligence to assist a tutor necessarily in helping a learner to learn. It's something quite different. And this, for me, is a great example of starting with the problem and then looking at a solution and then looking where the artificial intelligence might help. So we have a collaborative project with a company called Third Space Learning. Third Space Learning provide one-to-one -one tutoring for primary school age learners who are struggling with maths. This is paid for through pupil premium. The tutor is human, the child is human. The system connects them through a shared whiteboard and an audio link. That's not cutting edge technology yet, is it? But we know that one-to-one -one tuition is effective. In fact, Bloom's famous Two Sigma study demonstrated the efficacy of one-to-one -one tuition. For me, it also demonstrated something we often forget, and that is it's not the learner's fault, because actually if we change the teaching, we see different levels of progress, which tells you quite a lot about the importance of teaching. But anyway, so wouldn't it be great if we could provide this one-to-one -one human tutoring for everyone? as a support for children who are struggling, which is how it's being used at the moment, or maybe as a way of extending children who are particularly bright, because it's very hard, I know, I've been a secondary school teacher, to make sure you are tackling everybody's needs. You know, you have some children who are doing really well, others that are struggling, how do you manage to match those very different needs? So the way in which we are helping third space learning to use AI is quite different. The key problem is around a shortage of tutors to provide the one-to-one -one tutoring and an expense in that one-to-one -one tutoring that means that most people can't afford it. The people who can afford it are probably the people who least need it. So how do we tackle the problem of finding affordable one-to-one -one tutoring for the number of children who could benefit from it? Well, one of the things we need to do is to make sure that the tutoring is always good quality. And that's a key problem for third space learning, and that's where we come in. So we want to make sure that we can provide affordable tutors. So these tutors are in lots of different parts of the world, and that's what makes them affordable. But that's no good if those tutors are not meeting the individual learner's needs. At the moment, third space learning have to employ a relative army of evaluators to watch at least once a week every tutor to make sure that the quality is good. And if the quality isn't good, they evaluate them more and they provide support. So what we're doing with Third Space Learning is developing the artificial intelligence tools to automate that process of evaluating the tutors because that makes the third space approach scalable, because it reduces their costs dramatically if they don't have to have all those human evaluators. And it provides the potential to develop an individualized continuing professional development program for the tutors, because we will be able to 
tailor the professional development that they receive on the basis of the tutoring that they've done because we will have automated the evaluation of that tutoring. So it starts to really address the problem of providing good quality one-to-one -one tutoring for the number of children who could benefit from it. It's not about the AI replacing the teacher. It's not about the AI, in this case, interacting directly with the learner. It's about supporting the tutors and helping them to be more effective. And it's about reducing the human resource costs of the company that we're working with. Because after all, it is the human resource costs that make that examination system so expensive and make many educational interventions very expensive. People therefore tend to think we'll have the AI to replace the human resources. <coughs> what we're doing with this is, yes, we are replacing them, but not directly replacing the tutor, replacing the evaluators. And you may think, well, that's no good because you're, you're putting all these evaluators out of work. Well, those evaluators can be tutors themselves. There's nothing to stop them. And what's great about this system is you can recruit more and more tutors, people who've maybe only got two or three hours a week, people who are retired, people who are just wanting to increase their income by doing a little bit of tutoring. And we make sure that they're good quality tutors as well. So they were two specific examples of the way in which our research is demonstrating how we can build this dream of a Colin-like AI aid for tutors. So finally, to sum up, I want to leave you with these thoughts. And I love this song. You can't stake your lives on a saving machine by the sadly now departed David Bowie because everybody, when it comes to technology, is always looking for the silver bullet, the saving machine. It doesn't exist. We are not going to have saving machines that are going to step into our classroom, educate all our children, that are going to stand here instead of me and do all the lecturing. That's not the way forward. We need to look at how we design effective solutions to the key problems that we're facing. And that will need to be a blend of human and artificial intelligence. And the reason I said right at the start that maybe this should be a talk entitled Intelligence in the Classroom is because it's all about intelligence. And which part of the intelligence puzzle, if you like, is best achieved through artificial means and which through human means. And that's particularly important when it comes to the future of the workforce because we know that we can develop good automated machines that can do the routine cognitive material that we currently teach and assess in a lot of schools a lot of the time. What we can't do is build systems that can appreciate what they understand, can do this complex processing. So we'd better concentrate on helping our human learners to be good at that because that's what they're going to need in the workplace. We need to think about designing, designing AI assistants, assistants and co-pilots, not robot tutors. And it's important to think in terms of partnerships to be able to deliver the scale and bring AI benefits to everybody, and for me, especially the disadvantage. So our partnership with Third Space is an example of that. And therefore, we have to think in terms of hybrid systems that combine not just different AI techniques, different AI techniques and human intelligence effectively. We have to be intelligent in the way that we use artificial intelligence in the classroom. And I will stop there. Well, that was just fascinating. Um, thank you so much, Rose. So much to think about there. And I think, for me, one of the <laughs> important um, messages from that is that, that you know we have to it's a much more complex and nuanced area of work than we maybe imagine and some of our fantasies and science fiction based fantasies about, um, about machines and um, our human relationship to them are rather simplistic to say the least. So I think this is a, a really exciting kind of glimpse into some of the, the, the workings of, of AI. Um, educational research and Rose has been very modest but I, I, she may want to tell us about a very large project that she's now been very beginning <coughs> very soon which is extremely important to well the government and the department so please do mention that in a minute if you don't I'm just going to ask you okay <laughs> and it's great to see Mutla here as well he's one of our colleagues in the department so you know 
don't worry, I'm not going to make you come up and speak. But anyway, never mind um, my comments. Let's have some questions from the audience. Would you like to put your hand up? There are roving mics, so let's have the microphone and um, go right ahead. Hello, yes, my name is Gerard Hosier. Um, yes, a very interesting talk. Um, right now, we're just in the stone age, really, of AI. I don't think people realize where it can go, and it sort of exponentially is changing week by week, almost. Um, so um, my concern, though, is slightly that we have the, the children or the students um, give a, uh, share a lot with the AI. And so it's personal blogs, facial recognition, voice recognition, everything like that. And they're giving that to a company whose philosophy we don't know, maybe Aryan Rand philosophy, could be you know, Silicon Valley philosophy. Um, my concern is really how can we protect our children's identity from being managed, marketed, and tracked throughout their whole life um, by sort of going for maybe the slightly easy option of this. Okay. I just want to say, I didn't plant you. We don't know each other, do we? No, we don't. Because that is exactly the kind of question I would have wanted to be asked because it's a huge problem. You know, everything we do, quite rightly, as a university researcher and with the project that we're doing, has to go through ethics approval, and so it should. And it's, the problem you are highlighting is enormous. And my biggest worry at the moment is that because the complexity of what you've just described is so great, and people, of course, worry about their children in particular, they probably need to worry more about themselves, too. And, of course, the, the, the wanna cry that made me wanna cry, you know, attack last week just highlights how little most people know about what they need to do with their technology. And the same goes for their data. But if we don't have these conversations, if we don't raise the level of the discussion of exactly the problem that you're highlighting, we will close off the huge potential before it's even had a chance to develop. So for me, the most important thing, and the thing I talk to the Department for Education about a lot, is we've got to talk about this. We've got to get the right people in the room. We've got to look at how we protect that data. Can, I think personal ownership has to be the way forward. Um, there is not yet an explicit market in personal data. There is, by companies, trading personal data that most people don't even realize they've given away. But in terms of me saying, okay, I'm Rose Luckin and I've got this data and you can buy it for a grand or you can, be, that doesn't exist yet, but it will. And of course, the people who will be most disadvantaged in that will the be the people who have the least understanding of what's going on with their data. So we have to get this conversation going and we have to get it at the right level so we can start... Absolutely, before we lose the potential benefits because, of course, what you're highlighting is a worry. I get it. I'm a parent and a grandparent. You know, I totally get it. Yeah, so it's all about getting the right conversations in the right place. I know there was a lady over yeah, here. Yeah, let's see who else has got their hand up. Um, this lady here. Thank you. Well, cool. thank you very much, Professor Lockett. Um, I'm just wondering whether you can give us some insights into how and to what extent AI could become a motivational tool. Because in order to collect all this data, in order to advance student learning, we need to have them in the classroom and on task. And it is one of the biggest problems, yeah. you know, I certainly face as a university lecturer, you know, um, teaching to a half empty room. Yes, no, I, I, I agree with you and actually, Another colleague of Mutlu and Alz Manolis, that's his specialist area of research, is about motivation, how we track it, how we support it, how we keep people engaged in the task, how we look at motivation. There's a lot of work on motivation, um, actually, in the artificial intelligence and education field. So there are dynamic computer models of motivation that can track learners as they progress through a task and try and tailor what they're offered in order to keep them motivated. They're not perfect, but they're actually pretty good. So there's quite a lot of learning that we can take and start to integrate into these sorts of systems. And one of the 
very powerful things about this kind of open learner modeling that I was talking about is that actually showing people what motivates them, what doesn't motivate them, can be really helpful in terms of their selections of where they focus their attention and where they don't. So there is a kind of self-fulfilling motivation in knowing more about your motivation, if you see what I mean. Okay, let's see anyone um, over here. And they wait for the mic to reach you. Uh, thank you, Rose. Um, my name is John Agar. Um, I'm from the SGS department. Uh, and I think you've given us a very upbeat vision of AI in the classroom in 2027. Uh, we've had I mean, some of the sort of personal data worries raised. And the other things it makes me think about are whether the learning analytics would be turned into basically a management tool. I mean, it gives you fantastic information about how effective teachers are. And, it, and the monitoring is constant, not only of the students, but also the teachers. Yeah. So that, that's one issue. And then the second issue would be how one thing we have learned is that many of these systems can be gamed. There's so many incentives for behaving in ways which um, satisfy the, the, the sort of rules of what's being looked for, but obviously are not ideal actual learning yeah. situations. Um, so for example, essay writing can be automated, um, a fantastic cheat tool, a fantastic way of you know, also marking. You know, there's all kinds of other things which are more problematic yeah. about the AI uh, in the classroom of the future. And I just wonder whether you could just reflect a little bit on, on perhaps some of the darker side of what 2027 might be like. Yeah, I'm, they're very, both very good points. So I'll do the, the teacher spy question first and then I'll come into the gaming question. Yeah, and I, I've always been very upfront about the fact that if we do this kind of detailed analysis of a learner's progress, not just through the particular subject matter, but also in terms of their um, emotional well-being and broader skills around metacognition analysis, et cetera, et cetera, then of course we are also monitoring and tracking what's going on with groups of students, classes of students, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think, again, that's something that we have to be completely upfront about. And we have to have a discussion and say, well, where do the unions stand on this? How do professionals feel? Now, for me personally, I have no problem with it because I, and actually I think a lot of people don't have a problem with it because they want to understand more about whether what they're doing is being effective. And if it isn't, to understand more about why not. But it has to be open. We have to have that discussion and work out where we want to draw the boundaries. So. I agree with you. It is a dark side, but it's one that we've got to open up and think about and look at. When it comes to gaming, again, that's interesting. There's been a whole series of studies within the AI and education field looking at gaming the system. And there are ways that you can nudge people away from gaming. It's nice work, and I think it goes some way. But I think personally, it's more about opening up your gaming and looking at why you might be gaming and whether actually part of the problem is to do with the fact that the system, whatever that is, but say the education system here, doesn't recognize your skills. So therefore, you have to demonstrate them in another way. I always remember my first job as a research fellow. I went into school with, and this just shows how old it was, with a, a multimedia encyclopedia, state of the art at the time. And I was in a classroom, and we had three students sitting around this very big, chunky computer going through this multimedia CD. And this had model answer as one of the options. And in order to access the model answer, you had to enter a specified number of words. Very, very um, unsophisticated. And there were a group of three lads, and I remember them so well, sat around the computer, and they said, model answer, enter 250 words. And you could see it dawn on there. Like, space, space, click, 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 click. They looked around at the camera. They were so excited because they'd gamed the system, and they'd got access to this model answer, typing in a complete load of junk. And they then sat there and wrote one of the best answers <laughs> that we had in the whole study. And the point I'm trying to make is sometimes the gaming is for, a, you know, it's like, 
in that instance, they wanted to open up what they didn't really understand what they meant to do. But actually, once they'd seen it, they did actually start producing something very good. Now, for other people, it's because perhaps they're not very good at the area that they think they're being evaluated in. But maybe they've got other talents and they're not being recognized. I mean, things like resilience, for example. With the kind of tracking we're talking about, you can start to look at how much effort somebody is putting in. You know, do they keep going with a task or not? And maybe we can recognize that. For me, one of the best outcomes that this technology could have would be to have a situation where each individual person decides what's valuable about themselves. They're going to employ it. They're going to a university admissions day, whatever. They decide what, from their personal record, their dynamic learner model, which things they want to show. Because they will then be saying, I understand what I think you want to see, and I'm going to show it to you. I think that kind of approach is less gameable because people can follow their instincts and, and their talents can be recognized in a way that we just can't do with the current system. I'm not saying it solves all the problems, but I think it gets us some way there. Okay, I'd like to specifically <coughs> excuse me, invite any um, questions from students. Um, any student would like to be brave enough to ask a question, then you've got your chance right now. No? Yep, you got one. Yeah. Have we got a hand up somewhere? Uh, Over I, there, right, we'll go for it. I mean, actually, I'm not an educational student, actually. So, uh, actually, my question is, um, you know, have you considered about the situations uh, which the AI might collapse? Uh, because, uh, which AI might collapse? I mean, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Because I am a technological student and uh, I study AI, and from my perspective, AIs are quite stupid. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so sometimes, I, I mean, I mean, it, it might uh, could produce a good result in non t non person uh, per person conditions, but we cannot say uh, the rest one percentage is not is not important. So um, I think my question should be: How could you evaluate the evaluation results produced by AI, and how could you, could you uh, prevent them in some exceptional uh, situations, which it could cause some uh, bad consequences? Yeah. Cause some bad uh, consequences. Consequences. Okay. Yeah, that's a tricky question, isn't it? I think I, I agree with you. Actually. A lot of what AI is doing isn't particularly sophisticated, isn't particularly intelligent, but it can be quite useful if we use our human intelligence to apply it in the right way. So I think part of the answer is going back to my earlier point about unpacking the problem we want to solve very carefully and then recognizing what AI can't do and what AI can do. And maybe it is something that's not particularly intelligent, but it's something very useful. I mean, in many ways, what I've talked about with these visualizations and, and this constant tracking, that's not the really intelligent bit. That's the bit that technology is really good at. The people who write the algorithms that do the analysis, their intelligence will impact on how that machine behaves. Now, of course, with machine learning, it's a slightly different approach because we're looking at matching different patterns. But I think it has to be about seeing it as part of a solution, not the whole solution. And in terms of getting away from bad results, I can think of two bad consequences. Sorry, was your point. I can think of two sorts of bad consequences immediately, and, I, and there's obviously loads more. The first is that we trust AI too much. And I think there's a real danger of that. When I look at the level of um, interrogation that people do when they're told something, it's poor. And if we have AI presenting more and more information, will people believe it when it's actually a load of rubbish? So I think you know, human critical analysis evaluation is really important to stop that happening. Other kind of bad consequences you might have been thinking about are in this kind of realm of you know, computers taking control and doing things that are dangerous. Again, it's about recognizing what AI can and can't do and about having conversations now about the ethics of AI, not just around the personal data, though that is incredibly important, but also about the ethics of the AI 
algorithms aren't neutral. You know. Yes, yeah, responsibility, yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and, and so I think we have to take that on. But as ever, it's about opening it up and saying, well, OK, do we want robots to do this? Yeah, it's very useful. It might be very economically viable and save us shed loads of money. But is that a good reason for doing it? But unfortunately, a lot of big companies don't have to go through an ethics committee. And they can do all of these things. You know, are we going to accept it? So it would come, for me, to that first part of the AI issue that I didn't deal with, that I mentioned at the beginning, about educating people about AI. Not just the technologies so that lots of people can build AI systems, but everyone so that they understand what AI can, can't do, should, and shouldn't be able to do. Because unless we do that, then I'm afraid I would be less optimistic. <laughs> okay, I think that's... Um, I don't really want to end on a down note. No, no, that's <laughs> an interesting point to end on. And I think what Rose and the questions have drawn out is the, the enormously complex social and, and human challenge that surrounds, and political challenge that surrounds this development. It's not merely a technical challenge, but... The technology is the easy bit. Well, exactly. And so <laughs> it's lots to think about. And I think, do you want to plug a website or anything for people to look at? I won't, but I, but I will plug the project. Go for it. <laughs> Which quickly. isn't specifically AI-related, though it, it does address some of the AI issues. So we have a project starting at the Knowledge Lab, part of the Institute of Education at UCL, called Educate. It is about developing a shared working space, both physical and virtual, for educational technology companies up to the number of 250 employees, so small businesses, entrepreneurs, members of staff who are, I've got a new word, intrapreneurial, I think is the term. You know, if you're a member of staff or a student and you've got a great idea that isn't a business yet, but you think could be a way of getting technology to help people learn or teach, doesn't have to have AI, though we do have quite a lot of AI companies <laughs> coming our way, then we want to know about it because we can provide support, both in terms of advice, in terms of business, but also in terms of helping these businesses to understand more about existing evidence about what does and doesn't work. And in our first cohort, we do indeed have a couple of artificial intelligence companies. So there will be quite a lot of work happening in that space. Yeah, it's a really exciting project and <clears throat> really proud Thank to, you. to have it as part of the department's um, activities. So I know you've all got other classes to go to and you want to get on. So let's just thank Rose once again for her talk. My pleasure. Thank you.